Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's, it's always an honor to, to, uh, to do something like this for teachers and students because uh, for me, uh, playing is sort of like uh, bowling on Wednesdays. And you go and you throw the ball, you know, it's fun. Sometimes you hit a couple of pins, sometimes you wish you stayed home. And, and, uh, but the teaching is really important and, and NTC represents teaching. Not only your performance, but learning and teaching. You come here and you, and you uh, hear, I know for me, I, I learn something every time I come to one of these things. I'm always kind of lurking around, walking around, you know. And I hear people play, and I hear people play pieces that I've played for years and go, boy, that's, that's really a good way to play that. I think I'm going to start getting some of those ideas in there. So uh, that's the first thing that you need from any clinic that anybody can give you is to be open to new ideas. Because that's when you learn. When you, you say, you know, what, what's the worst thing you could say when you go to your, let's say you're going to your first college lesson, right? You show up and got your horn out and you're ready and you sit in a chair and, and you play for your teacher. And uh, the teacher says, well, you know, I think, I think you should uh, try to tongue those notes a little more, sp you know, sharply. And then you say, but my teacher said, what, what happens? That's the immediately disconnect. That's a disconnect. So when you go somewhere and you're in the presence of people who uh, have a great deal of knowledge. I can't tell you, I, I've been to master classes. I still go to master classes a lot. And uh, I can't tell you how much I've learned in those classes. But you have to be open to change. If you only feel secure with what you do, you're destined to stay there forever. Now you might like that maybe, but, but I'm not that person myself. And as I get older, it's, it's even more exciting because I'm almost for trying to figure out how to play for another five, ten years if I'm lucky. You know, at 70, your life changes. At, at 20, at 18, when you go to college, it changes if you let it. How many people have been somewhere where somebody is almost the same level they are? And in four years, one person has grown a great deal and the other person hasn't. And there's, you, you, you go, how could this happen? We, we practice the same things. We, you know, we're in the same ensembles. Uh, we have the same teacher, right? We eat the same awful food at the cafeteria. You know, how could, uh, well, it, it's in how you practice. You have to remember that your teacher only spends, uh, you know, as many hours as they're able a week. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's in master classes. Sometimes it's they're your teacher in an ensemble. You know, there's a lot of, but for all intents and purposes, usually our private lessons last about an hour a week. Sometimes a couple of them if you have a recital coming up, you know, and stuff like that. But basically now, so what happens the other 20 hours a week? That's where the difference is. The difference is in the practice room when you're alone. So first of all, when you show up at a university or to take a lesson with somebody, you have to buy into what they're talking about immediately. No, you know, well, I don't know about that, and I don't know that. Because that might be something that could really help you. Even if you just file it away. I can't tell you, you know, I, I used to go to master classes by different people like Armando Gatala. How many people know who Armando Gatala is? That's okay. Everybody should know who that is. Go find out. It's easy. It takes about five seconds on the, if you can spell his name. Okay. Uh, to, to find out what he did and, and who he was. And I used to go to his classes and, he, and always I would sit in the back, you know, and, and he would, finally he'd go, Vince, is that you back there? <laughs> and I'd say, yes, it is. And he'd say, what are you doing here? I said, I didn't get it all last time. <laughs> and it's true. Because really, the lessons that I've taken, you could probably count on one hand. So I'm not proud of that. I, I wish I was lucky. I mean, maybe that's why I teach. And I, I care so much about teaching. 
is because I, my high school band director was a trumpet player and he was actually an excellent teacher because he made me think. He never told me sort of how to do much, except that doesn't sound good. And you have to have a little bit of that in you as a student. That's enough, that should be enough to make you really practice. If it isn't, well, I don't know. It's probably better not to practice at all. You know, because you're not serious enough about doing it. Now, I, I, I kind of put a little sheet together, and what I'll do is I'm going to leave these sheets up here, and you can come, those of you who don't have it already from, <laughs> from uh, what, what's it called, AirDrop? Yeah. Um, you can take a picture of these. I'll leave these up here, and you can take a picture of both sides of this. It's nothing earth-shattering. It's just something that you can look at, and it kind of uh, is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, you have to remember... Uh, that this is not a musical instrument. This is a mechanical device. There's nothing that this has to say about music. This is a musical instrument. So this could, it has to emulate what's here. If there's nothing here, it really doesn't matter how well you play this because it's not going to affect anybody in a really positive way. So you have to remember that it's a tool. If you don't have a vision for what this tool is supposed to do or sound like, in our case, it's kind of pointless. So, well, how do we make up for that? Well, practicing is, uh, depends on how much, uh, what you're going to do with your trumpet. You know, if you're a person that just does it as an uh, avocation, maybe you practice a half hour a day, that's just fine. But then you also need to listen a half hour a day because you need something to go with the practicing. If you're a person that, you know, maybe is a music ed major, maybe you practice a couple hours, hour and a half, maybe an average of an hour and a half a day, okay, as a music ed major, uh, for those of you that are in college already. Um, so maybe you need to listen about an hour and a half a day. And if you're, you know, plan on being a, uh, I, I call it play professionally. That doesn't mean you're a professional musician. That means that you play at a level that's very high. If you aspire to do that, maybe you need to practice. I'm just putting numbers on this. It could be any number. Three hours a day. But that means you're also responsible to practice for three hours a day. I mean to hear for three hours a day. Listen to things for three hours a day. Okay? And the reason is you need more information. You need more information like about... Uh, different players, different instru instrumental groups. What does this do in every possible kind of scenario? Uh, so that's, a, that's an important thing. Uh, either one of these things left undeveloped disables our ability to improve and contribute musically now and in our future. A lot of people really don't practice very much, but at one point in their life, they practiced a fair amount if they have some success. They've made the connection between the mechanical device and the musical instrument. And you know people like that in your community. The only time they ever pick up a trumpet is when they have to play it somewhere. And within 10 minutes, they sound pretty good. And if they play all week, they sound really good. So how does that happen? Is it an accident? No. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, uh, it's like riding a bicycle. You, you fall off. You don't go, well, riding a bicycle, that's too hard. I'm not going to do it. Well, everybody's riding a bicycle. You don't want to be the person that doesn't ride it. So you keep falling off and, you know, you fall over on this leg and it's all cut up. And then you, next, you fall over on this leg because you thought maybe that was the right way to do it. And, but you eventually get the balance. And once you do, if you continually work towards, all of a sudden you're standing up on the seat and you're riding, you know, then you have no hands. <laughs> and if you're like my brother, you do it with motorcycles which when he was in, when I, when I came back from uh, music school the first year, year, he took me for a ride on his motorcycle, which was the last time I've ever been on a motorcycle <laughs> because he took me around the block like this and I was on the back. I was holding on for life. But he also races cars now at Bonneville Saw Flats. He builds cars. His son is, does that, uh, what's it called? Drift. You know what Drift is? Okay, well, he's one of the top Drift guys, Andrew DiMartino. Check it out. 
It's scary. <laughs> but my brother is very serious, but he's also a great drummer. But he builds cars. But the discipline that it takes to do what we're talking about is the discipline that's used to do anything well. So even if you're not going to be a professional musician, you should practice to play professionally at a level that sounds way above. Because you have to evaluate yourself on a daily basis, don't you? You have to listen to it. Yeah. And if you can listen to something bad for a long time, I don't know. My band director would just do this. He'd be conducting, right? Then he'd go like this. <laughs> and he'd just keep conducting. And I'd go home and I'd say, Mom, he looked at me. <laughs> that meant that between number 40 and number 50, something was wrong. But he never called me out in band, ever. Because he knew me. He knew that I would go home and I would find out somehow what was wrong. I'd just dis completely destroy the music, every rhythm, every articulation, every dynamic, anything else that I could figure out that I might have not gotten right. The style, maybe I missed a word that told me actually what it was supposed to sound like, you know? So you gotta have a little bit of that in you, the fanaticism of a practice person to get the mechanical device to sound like the musical instrument. Okay? I want to go through, I'm trying to, gonna, try to go through a lot of things because usually I run out of time and I, I wish I could do these for three hours because I like doing that. Uh, all plans, you, you, have to, you have to plan for the long run. Uh, we'll determine the value of what we do with this. All works are a combination of coordination of the mind and body creating an art, artful presentation. Timothy Dockshutzer said to me one time, actually, this is really good because it's about master classes. Uh, I was in Ukraine, and uh, Timothy Dockshutzer, how many people know who Timothy Dockshutzer is? Good. That's better. Still not everybody. Everybody needs to know who it is. Okay, look him up. Played a ten and a half C mouthpiece, a bench trumpet for his whole career. Look, at him, look on the YouTube and watch him play. It's, it's just, and listen because it's beautiful. Uh, he was about five years older than I am now, and he had really stopped playing. And he said, uh, can you play one of these etudes in the master class? And of course, I was excited. I said, wow, this is great. Yeah, I'd love to play in the master class. So I, you know, I walked away, and I said, he got a new book like this one. Look. Uh, and uh, he said, well, just pick one of these etudes out. So I, 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 I picked out something, and, and then I was walking away, and I realized that I had never played in a master class, ever. I had been giving master classes for years, but w when I went to Eastman, we didn't have a master class. We just took private lessons, you know, did what we could. And so I, was, I said, man, I never played in a master class before. I started getting nervous about it, you know. I was thinking, geez, I'm supposed to be able to do this already. I don't know. So anyway, and I don't remember. I'll, I'll play. This is my warm-up for today almost. But, you know, you, you can't worry about warming up. You didn't, you didn't forget how to walk when you got up this morning, did you? Okay. Did you get really worried when you got out of bed? I said, oh, my gosh. I wonder if I'm going to be able to walk today. And you've been doing it, you know, like every day for your whole life, you know. So you, you, you can't, get, you know, and, and you still can stumble, right? It doesn't matter if you stumble, but you'll get with it. You know, it's, it's just not a matter of, of getting that. If you get that freaked out when you start in the morning, good luck. Because you'll be on the trip that I was on, which was no fun. You know, I, I couldn't even say trumpet when I was your age when I had to play it because it, I was so nervous about it. You have to get it really, you have to start realizing that you, you don't forget how to play. Da. Okay, see, I'm pretty close. <laughs> I'm remembering, every one of you has a really good memory. You don't know it, but you do. So start to memorize what you hear, because trumpet does not work by reading music. 
There is no such thing as printed music. You hear anything? <laughs> I don't hear anything. Because there is no such thing as printed music. Now, printed music is, uh, you know, could you imagine if when Beethoven wrote the Fifth Symphony, he goes, okay, we're going to learn the Fifth Symphony today. Okay, strings. It goes like this. G, 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 E flat. Okay, you ready? G, G, no, no. Same, that, this octave, this octave. It would have taken them a month to learn the first page of the score. You see what I mean? So printed music is so that you can remember the sound of music when you're practicing. Da, 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 da. I forgot the pitch that we were on, but that's all right. So that was basically the same intervals, right? So when you see music notes, you have to hear what you see. If you don't, the trumpet will not operate. You'll be playing in a skid if you're lucky. That's why endurance is a problem for a lot of people because they're always playing in a skid. And they wonder why G, G on the top of the staff is easy. And then three notes later, it becomes like double high C. Yeah, it's, why, did, why is it so hard to play that same note? I just played it a minute ago, a second ago. Because we've lost the way the instrument works. So anyway, Doc Schutzer got me up there. And, you know, and I started, and the first person went up, didn't go real well. And, and that didn't make me any feel any less nervous, you know, because they were a really good player, and I said, oh, my God, I'm next. So let me, get a, let me get a different horn. I can't play anything on this thing. Um, Uh-oh. Well, yeah, that's it. Uh, so... It was something like that that was his little exercise in his book. And I have a picture with him with his hand here going, this is what the book is about. And I was lucky. And, and it, you can't practice music without practicing technique. You can't practice technique without practicing music. So you can't lose sight of any of those things because those are the things that are, need to be connected together and become one. See, so when you play the instrument, the instrument, uh, has to be lined up with the musical instrument. This, this technical thing has to be lined up with that. So when you're playing, you can't be thinking. It's, but, you know, I, I, I learned this. The reason I learned this was because I would always do fairly well in, like, in my jazz concerts. And then I played classical stuff, and I, I just had the hardest time getting through everything. I, mean, I just had a terrible time. And uh, of course, that made, you, made me nervous, you know? So basically, I couldn't figure it out until one day I realized that when I played jazz, I, li I heard the music. When I played classical music, I read the notes. I read C's and C sharps and D's. But see, wouldn't transposition be easy if you didn't read the notes and you just heard the intervals? Ah, you see, see, see what I'm talking about? See, transposition is kind of a misnomer. It really is, is singing the same thing. And is there any tuba players in here? Good. We can talk about them. <laughs> yeah. You ever notice that the tuba players pick up uh, any tuba and they can play the right notes? F tubas, E flat tubas, B flat tubas, C tubas. It doesn't matter. They pick it up and after practicing for a week or two, they can play the written part, which is always in C. You see what I mean? So if tuba players can do it, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, so we have to start thinking much more simply about how we play, how we, how we translate 
what we see. If, you, if it's a visual image that you see on a page, you will always have trouble playing. Okay? If you hear sound, things will start to become one. See, so when I'm playing, if I put, start on this out, Okay. See what I mean? Those are the right fingerings for all those. So when you're improvising, you see you're really just hearing something and you're already connected to it. So you said. See, so that's, how could you, how could you write that out? I mean, and some of the transcriptions, don't buy transcription books. Because that defeats the whole purpose of learning the sound. The music is in what you hear, not what notes you're writing. Because it's deeper than, than notes, okay? So, and it also improves your ear. I used to make my students transcribe orchestral excerpts. They hated it. It was great. And then when they would write it out, you know, and I'd show them the, they go, really? They, I said, yeah, that's, that's really what you have to play. Oh, man. I, they learned to really understand what dotted quarter notes, dotted, dotted eighths and sixteenths were, triplets were in 12 8, et cetera, et cetera. You see, because they became indelible in their what? their sonic memory. So every day, that's another part of the listening. It becomes part of your sonic memory. I can still, I can still hear A flat concert. What, of what orchestral piece from the late Romantic period is A flat, the very first note comes in piano? You can't hear the trumpet at first. All you hear is all these tinkly sounds that the strings and other people are making. What is that? Poem of Ecstasy. I can still get, I'm getting the chills now. I was sitting in the back row like back there, only it was about, I don't know where, in Chicago Symphony Hall. And Chicago Symphony was playing that. And I, you know, I didn't really know the piece that well at the time. You know, I was just, I was just there because it was poem of ecstasy, and I wanted to hear it. And I'm sitting there, and I hear all these tinkling sounds, you know. And all of a sudden, I, I think the trumpet's playing. Oh my God! I started to shake because the, it was so fantastic. It was a sonic experience. Music is a sonic experience. It's not something you see. So when you're playing, I heard a lot of people today, I heard about, I don't know, about six people play solos today. And some people, I heard them, some very good, um, accurate performances of the, and then I heard other people that were pretty accurate too, but I was emotionally connected to what they were doing. I had no idea what they were doing. You don't have to, otherwise nobody would ever come to concerts, right? If it took some kind of a, lecture before each concert that you had to go to to learn how to listen to the music, nobody would go to concerts, you know. So basically, everything that needs to be in a piece has to be something emotional that people can connect to who don't play instruments. We're not playing for musicians most of the time. They might be musically inclined, so to speak, but they're not p performing musicians. They don't they don't get excited about, wow, that was a great high C. You know, <laughs> they, don't, they, just, they just know the effect of what happened when they, when they heard you do something. Like when people hear a Zarathustra. Right? Oh my God, you, get, you immediately get chills live. How many people have heard that live, Zarathustra? 
Yeah. There's nothing like it, or any piece for that matter. So, you know, attend live, live concerts. Anyway, first of all, breathing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all these things that I don't want you to believe. I don't expect anybody to believe anything I say. But I do hope you'll consider some of the things and keep them in the back of your mind because they might become useful in the future as you uh, uh, keep learning more and more about playing trumpet. It was a slow process for me. Uh, first of all, breathing. Uh, all of us are pretty good at breathing because everybody's moving. So that's a good sign. I'm happy every day when I get up. I go, I'm still moving. This is good. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I do, my breathing is a little different. I, I do ho inward. Ready? And ha. And the reason I use ha, and I'll tell you, I'm going to explain these things just a little bit because... We only have a half hour left, okay? And uh, it's because the tongue has four parts to it, okay? And uh, you don't have to know any of this. You can, you can assess it when you play. You don't have to start measuring things, okay? Because like I say, I'm, I'm a dirt farmer. Never really took lessons, but I, I'm very serious about practicing and learning. So. This is the front of the tongue, right? What's it used for? T yeah, the articulation, T. This is the next part of the tongue. What's it used for? What? Ah, everybody's scared. I love it. The K. There's no K back here. Unless you want it, don't want a double tongue above the staff. In which case, continue to use the K back here. Okay? <laughs> Because Arben, in, in his wisdom, what language did he speak? Did he ever say the word K in his life? No, he did not. That's not in the French language. So when you read the Arben book, I learned this from Gatala, by the way. Thank you, Armando. And uh, the K is, it's, it's not even two. It's You hear the air? Now I'll do it the way most people do it. Ta, ka. <laughs> do you ever notice nothing comes out? You can go ka, 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 and nothing hits your hand. So why do you think your lips should vibrate when you do that? I tried for years. It didn't work. So like when you're when you're double tonguing, I don't know if I. This would be a good warm up. Great. Okay. So, that's good warm up. Okay, but you could see that I zeroed in on it, right? I zeroed right in on it because it's all in the front. What's now? That's the that's the second part. Okay, what's the third part? It's the one that changes the size of the air column inside your mouth. The air should never go into the lower jaw, ever. <laughs> I, want, I don't want you to believe any of this. <laughs> I want you to think about it, okay? Everybody say the word, the. the. Okay, did you notice? Your tongue is touching your top teeth, okay? If I was to do like this, you would bite your tongue on both sides. That's where my tongue is when I play, all the time. Whew. That's bad. Okay, now, but at, at, at the same time, when you lower your tongue, what happens? That part stays up along the teeth, see? So that the air slows down, not because you're blowing less, but because the space is bigger, okay? Let's use some words. I, don't, I, I was nice enough to leave my pencils and pens home today. This is, holds up buildings in, at the Parthenon. What is it? Air column. Okay. Uh, Chickowitz, air. Flow. Fl good. I love this. Flow. Okay. Air. 
Stream. Yeah, I heard it. You ever heard a teacher use the word air ball except to miss notes? No, they never said, how about air cave? I never heard that one either. So your air never goes into your oral cavity. It goes through your oral cavity. Your tongue points towards this little hole here. If it points into your oral cavity, how does it get out of there with great difficulty? And it doesn't know where to go. But if you go, it goes right in the hole. Good gosh, you don't want that to happen, do you? That's called efficiency. That's what the real meaning of efficiency is. When people say be more efficient, I mean, that always was like a mysterious term to me. You know, there's so many mystery terms. And uh, if you study the old books, you'll see that most of them use terms that talk about something that is shaped like the pen or pencil. Stream, flow, the word, so people don't like the word compression. I like it because as I increase the compression, that cracks up to the next note, you see. Keeps cracking up until, and, uh, and I'm gonna cover the three things uh, that, the way I do it. Use the mouthpiece, I'm gonna do this for you because the, everybody would talk about support, because I just wanna introduce things to you so that you can be really confused when you leave, okay? <laughs> Now, when you're doing that, how many people have done something like this? Okay, good. That's great. And uh, I do it about two or three times a week because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tuned into what I'm doing every day. And I, and, but if I feel like I'm getting off the track, I do this. And I play it for 25 to 30 seconds. I do it once for like five seconds, make sure I've got a really good zip going and I get better breath. <gasps> and I use that syllable. But then what happens when you do that? When you do that lead pipe, are you supporting more, less, or the same? Just playing that one note. How many people think more? I do. How many people think less? How many people think the same? Okay, so in other words, you have the same amount of air in your lungs all the time. That's my point. Okay, you see, so in other words, if you were to take a balloon Everybody, uh, get your balloon out. You got it? You know the I word? What is it? Imagination? Get your balloon out. Okay, good. thank you. Okay, everybody get your balloon out. Here we go, ready? We're going to blow up the balloon with one complete blow. Take your breath, that, as I mentioned. Ready? Okay, now you got it held, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to just let the sound come out and we're going to hold the same pitch, okay, without doing anything except holding the end. So this is what you end up with. <laughs> right? Because the only way you can control that balloon is by doing what? Squeezing the end, our lips. That's why when you play like, you try to decrescendo on a G on top of the staff, it's really depressing, isn't it, sometimes? <laughs> They're going like this, right? And you're going, this ain't gonna work out very well, <laughs> you know? And that used to be the story of my life. Anything soft, anything that was treacherous like that, I was a nervous wreck. But, okay, now, is there a way, some of you know the answer, don't, don't tell anybody. But, okay, so you take the balloon now, and we're still in the same place we were. How would you play the same pitch with one action and not have to squeeze the end? That's why they invented arms. You take the balloon, and as the balloon gets smaller, what do you do with your arms? You push them into the balloon so that the musical instrument doesn't get worried. Otherwise, what happens? The alarm goes off up there. You're going to lose it. Press harder. 
Squeeze, squeeze your lips. That'll do it. Press harder and squeeze your lips. That'll, that sure is gonna fix it. Yeah, see what I mean? When the alarm goes off, what does that mean? It's too late. That means you're done. You're, you know, you're gonna have to make a guess and maybe you'll get lucky. You know, so basically, when you, when you play, you're always supporting more because you have less air. See, even on that one note, I was supporting more everything. So support is the, the coefficient, the, the important part about support is that everything, as Al Vizzuti told me one time, he didn't know he was telling me the most important thing that I would ever hear. He said that everything you do is one complete blow of the trumpet. And when he said that after his master class, I ran down the stairs to the place. I said, Al, that was the greatest thing I ever heard anybody say. He goes, what? I said, I've always wanted a way to tell people kind of what I felt. I couldn't come up with words. It meant that it was a repetitive process. You see what I mean? Yeah. So if you take a breath in and you're constantly supporting more, the air is going to be entering this in a similar fashion. So the decisions you make with your tongue and jaw position are going to do what? They're going to be the same instead of different. If you're going, see, you've added another variable. So I have another exercise I'll show you that you can practice this uh, really quickly. It's the, uh, uh, you can come and help me. You can be my assistant. Come on over. Yeah, this is real easy. Even I can do this, so you can do it. I should have had the duck come on. He's not the duck anymore, though. That's what I hate about Eric Miller. When he studied with me, I used to call him the duck because he sang, when he played, go quack, quack when he played. <laughs> and now he sounds like a professional trumpet player, and I can't call him the duck anymore. It sucks. Anyway, okay, so your job, I'm going to play G on top of the staff, which is the only note that I play all day, okay? And your job is to just touch my back, and I have to play E as quickly as humanly possible without stopping playing G. Okay, you got the picture? Mm -hmm. And then, so you're going to do it one, let's see, one, two, uh, wait a minute, four, four times. Uh, this is hard. I just do it. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, well, so I'll hold the note out. When you think I got a good grip on it, so to speak, uh, then you just touch my, at random, not in a normal way. Okay, now why did I do that? To show you that that was a norm. The top note's my norm. I know exactly how to deviate from that norm. So what would happen if I did that slower? It's the same, right? You get the picture? Yeah. You see, so that no matter when he touches my back, I'm going to still be able to play G, and it's going to come out just the same way. Isn't that a make you relax and feel good? Performance anxiety is caused by the feeling that you don't know what's going to come out, right? So if you're playing something and you go, right? It doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? Because I am almost positive that those notes are going to come out. And if they don't, I'd be surprised. It'd be a nice surprise. I go, oh, what do you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Isn't that a good way to feel? OK, so that has to come. Thank you very much. He was excellent. Yeah. So, so everything that I'm telling you is really to help you build confidence and knowledge that you know you can do something. Because it all is mechanically, trumpet is not musical. It is mechanical. If you don't address it, what happens? You got the best driver in the world and the crappiest race car on the track. It does not win races. And winning means just sounding musical. See what I mean? It doesn't mean winning a competition like you're in. Everybody wins 
to me when you come here because you all are really serious musicians, caring, hardworking. I feel energy. I get energy for a year when I do this, when I teach at Interlochen in the summer, when I do uh, the uh, Australasian uh, Trumpet Academy. I go there, when I go do master classes at every school, uh, you, most of you are people I've seen before and been to your school and worked with your students and that's where I want to be. I want to be where the energy is because it makes a difference to you and to me. So I want you to start thinking about your practice room habits. Are you just repeating it over and over? What, what's, what's that definition of insanity? Just keep doing the same thing over and over again and hope it's going to change. No, you have to constantly use some sort of a scientific method or trial and error or something. You have to change. I always make my students put their horn down immediately. They, they're always going, da, 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 da. I'm going, wait, stop. What were you thinking in between each one of those tries? They weren't thinking. Play the trumpet. Play it again. Try it again. Do it again. Do what? You see what I mean? I'm not smart enough to think that fast. I, I go and I say, oh, that was pretty horrible. Okay. Well, what are you going to do to make it not sound horrible? Are you going to just try it again? No, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, well, what did I, what, what was really not good about that? You see what I mean? Okay. So, I did that. Long tones. How many people have play on a regular basis the first page of the Arben book? <laughs> That's surprising that that many do. I used to skip that because I, I sounded so bad when I played the long tones that, you know, I, I just didn't want to sound bad, so I just figured I'd skip that part. Okay. And basically, playing the long tones is playing that G with the lead pipe correctly. The reason I chose G, is because F concert, is because that is the norm for this size instrument. You can deviate so that the air is slower because the space is bigger, or you can raise your tongue more so that the space becomes smaller and you crack up to the next notes. And you learn that from trial and error. And you practice out of books. Uh, one of the things, insist, first of all, insist on everything being done in rhythm. I don't know if you noticed that, that every time I played one of those licks, it was exactly the same. It was pretty much the same tempo, the same articulation, the same tuning, which was one note flat. And you see what I mean? Because that's what you have. You have to be coordinated to play a trumpet. You can't just say higher. Higher than what? It's a higher note. Da ha. No, well, you might hit four notes. You know? It, it, so basically, you have to really hear what's there. And through your practicing, you have to remember how to do that. So it's all memory, but it becomes what? Part of walking. I'm walking over here. I'm not thinking about where my feet are going. I'm just looking at where I'm going, and I'm using my mobility, and all these muscles and everything's working. So if you're thinking about thinking that way, that's too much thinking. Just get a vision, stick with it, OK? Never stop the inner metronome. Here we go, ready? All these notes are the same value. Okay? Those are all eighth notes in the duple time, right? Eighth notes are always exactly the same length. All those notes were exactly the same. The tempo was different, but the value of the notes stayed the same. So you know exactly it's a half a beat. When you're playing a cadenza, how many people usually crash in cadenzas more than the rest of the piece? Because you stop the metronome and you start playing the trumpet, all these beautiful things, and they go, let's see what, no, I was going to go faster. No. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, you can change anything you want, but you cannot change the metronome. The metronome is always ticking. It might be ticking at different. See what I mean? 
I know exactly where I'm going to place my finger. I know exactly where I'm going to tongue. I know exactly when I'm going to play and where I'm going to play a certain volume, right? I know exactly where I'm going to do a certain articulation because I've practiced it over and over again in the same perspective rhythmically. So cadenzas are in rhythm. It's just nobody can hear it except you, okay? Uh, flexibility. Ah. Flexibility is related to the one blow of the trumpet we've been talking about. Uh, work from a variety of books to train your ear. Okay, and, and the reason I, I have this book here, of course, Scott actually gave it to me just, re, just outside there, but I already had it and I've already started looking at it and it's very depressing. But, but it's also, he, he was nice enough to dedicate it to me for being so mean to him when he was studying for his oral exams. And, uh, but it's uh, every kind of book, from Arben to Colin to Schlossberg to Belk. It doesn't matter what you practice out of. It just matters that you hear and you start to develop the coordination that it takes to make your instrument work efficiently. Um, let's do a couple of things, and then I'm going to have questions from people. Uh, listen, if you're not uh, assigned YouTube uh, and Spotify and other things, uh, I don't list to Spotify because the musicians make no money off of it, so I don't, it's not on my radar. But you can listen to anything you want. Um, listen to public radio, classical stations, and, and, and you, you learn a lot. You learn a lot of different literature, especially not trumpet literature, because most of the things we play are not trumpet literature. So make sure you're doing that as another part of your, you know, learning experience, or jazz band, or brass quintet, or any, any of those things, they're all good. I love every kind of music, and I try to participate. I'm the, the jack of all trades and the master of none. But I enjoy being that person, you know. I don't purport to be really great at anything. Uh, listen to your assign, or assign yourself. Take your friends. Uh, John Hagstrom used to give, I think he gave every student an iPod, or he made them get an, an iPod when they were popular. You can use your phone now. Trade lists. Put 10 things on a list, okay, and give it to your, your colleagues in your trumpet class or people that are taken from the same teacher of you. Is let your teacher uh, develop a list for you. They don't have to be long things. They have to be things that are necessary to have in your oral library so that you, when you see something, you relate musically. All the articulations, all the style, the way of playing it becomes it's already stored there, okay? That's a really important thing. Every person should know what's happening in a piece. If, if my student doesn't know, I don't have many students now because I, I really, I'm old and impatient. And uh, if people don't practice a lot, I, I really don't want to teach them. I just, I don't, I don't have the patience anymore. So, but, uh, but I do teach people who work hard, always. I always have time for those people. Um, Know, know what's happening in a piece. Those of you who've been in jazz bands that I've directed know that I'm liable to stop any time and ask the trumpets, uh, trumpets, can you uh, tell me what the saxophones are playing at this point? And they go, are the saxophones playing? <laughs> okay, you see what I'm talking about? Because just being able to play your part has nothing to do with playing a piece. Being a part of the piece in the proper perspective, you should be able to sing almost every person's part in a piece, or at least know the rhythms, or know what the balance should be at a particular point. You might not be able to negotiate every note, you see what I mean, but the balance, the way you see it. So in other words, like knowing the score, hearing the score, okay? Uh, music teaching is, is uh, not only to create performing musicians, but also people who understand what they are playing and hearing. Being ready to call on at random anybody that you know and ask them what's going on in any particular point in a piece. What is the important thing that's going on right now when we stopped? And if they don't know, say, okay, let's do it again. And they're gonna listen, okay? You, can, don't, you don't have to, they've already been embarrassed enough. You don't have to embarrass them anymore, okay? Just, just stop and go. Uh, now we're gonna do a couple of definitions and then there's a list on the back of this and it's not anything earth shattering. It's far from being complete or correct. It's just a bunch of names that came to my mind. 
It's traditional music, meaning classical mostly, and jazz music, and different groups and individuals, and I just randomized them. What's the difference between loud and soft? Oh, come on. Where are we? We're not in Danville, Kentucky now. I, I live in Danville, Kentucky. I would expect this response from, what's the difference? What note can you hold longer, a loud note or a soft note? So what's the difference? The amount of air. You run out of air faster when you play a loud note. The aperture's bigger and you can't hold the note as long. So that's the difference. So if you want to, but that doesn't mean you don't support when you play soft. Because why? Support is inversely proportionate to the amount of air you have left. You're always supporting more. You play a high note and then a low note, you're supporting more. Okay? Then you play another high note and you're supporting more. Then you go play a low C and you're supporting more. Why? Remember the lead pipe? That's the operation one. That's what most people don't have together. That's why no method works for them. If you study with, you know, the most famous teachers, Bill Adam, uh, uh, what's his name, Arnold Jacobs, uh, you know, uh, all the great teachers, you know, they can't help you unless you get that straightened out, what happens before you blow into the trumpet. Otherwise, what happens? You're frustrated because you're doing all the things they tell you to do and they don't work. So my job is not to, actually, I believe that every one of those teachers is excellent because I've gained a lot from reading the books and, you know, taking lessons from some of them. Carmine Caruso, I took lessons from Carmine Caruso. Everybody thought he was like nuts, you know. I didn't. I got a lot out of those lessons. They really helped me a lot. Matter of fact, I was really having trouble playing and in the space of a month I was playing a lot better. Okay? So basically, what's the difference between fast and slow? If each note is an event, what happens to the events? They get closer together. So that's why it's important to play in tempo. So, uh, so basically, the events, like, so if you're playing, you know, eighth notes, I'll do something there. So we're going to go. Right? Five to the beat, and six to the beat, seven to the beat. How many people practice that at least once a week? Practice that. Why, why can't people play uh, at least Roger Soldat? Just the, because they never practice fives, and then they expect to just sit down and play five. Well, you can't, and you should be able to single tongue that too, by the way. What makes your single tongue faster? It has to do with your perception of notes. Okay, can you do this? Two notes, right? So if you can do two, can you do three that way? Yeah, what do you know? What do you know? I just did two notes twice. Four notes with one. So maybe I can do four notes twice with one. Good heavens! My single tongue's better already. You see what I'm saying? If you try to single tongue nine notes in a row, your mind doesn't get nine notes in a row. Mine doesn't. I mean, I can only count to four. So, and if it's in five, four, it has to be two plus three or three plus two. There are no fives in my, my mind at all, okay? So you see how I practice? It's a very simple way. It's very simple. So how fast did I play compared to how fast you play, have to play in, uh, in the da 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 much faster. So I should be able to play that. If I, and I practice fives in the scales. It's, how many fingers do you use when you play it? If you play it on C Trevor. Oh, come on. You know, it doesn't take much to do that. Or you can do the ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ta ka ta 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 I can't the, the chances of me doing that are not good. Okay? <laughs> anyway. What's the difference between high and low? Uh oh, we get to the hard stuff now. The imp 
the intensity, the speed. You want to use the word compression. I like it. Most people don't. Compression of the air. What happens is, what happens if you, I, I, I don't want to do, I'm going to do this, but if I crack the first few notes tonight, you'll know why. Um, when, let, I'm going to play high now without, well, let, when they say, uh, I'll just do it. I'm going to play high now. How come, how come I won't go high? Well, I, I, I let my lips spread out. What's the difference in high, high, what's the difference between loud and soft, first of all? Go, let's go back there. It's less air going the same speed through a smaller hole. So now, if you play high at the same volume, is the hole in your lips smaller, bigger, or the same? So it's softer too then, right? Okay, I want, that's why I want you to think clearly. Uh, so in other words, when you go high, your lips get smaller, right? No. You think they do. But then why does every book, every book, say when you go higher, you tighten up your lips? For the reason that I made that ugly sound. If you try to play higher with that more excited air column, it spreads the lips apart. So the only reason you tighten your lips when you play higher is to keep them the same. So when you, when you try to play, you're just going, <coughs> see, all I'm doing is just blowing anything, right? <coughs> see, you just, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm not trying to play any note in particular, right? So basically, all you have to do is keep them, when you're doing your lip slurry exercise, you're doing your flexibility exercise of any type in any book. Right? I'm trying to do them all slurred without tying. See, so that if I keep the hole the same and I move my jaw right, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get the notes. Don't try to do things that are easy. Anybody can do things that are easy. Learn to do things easily. Easily. Okay? Uh, what's the difference? What is the difference between creativity and interpretation? We have a lot of those things happening here. Creativity is part of playing. It's not everything. Interpretation means that you have a certain landscape that you have to play within in classical music, in certain, in most cl traditional classical music, let's just say that, okay? So basically, you have to fit your trumpet into the landscape of music. That's why it's important to know music theory, music history. Everybody studies that, right? Yeah, well, sort of, right? How many people, uh, this is about music theory, how many people practice their sight singing uh, materials more than 10 minutes before the sight singing exam? <laughs> yeah, a few. We, had a, we got some hands. That's good. That's good. That is probably the most important thing for you to practice. Matter of fact, when my, my son Gabriel uh, took his first lesson with John Hagstrom, he went in there and, you know, he had to etude pretty to play you know he was he was burning to play his Charlie A etude for him so he starts and uh, he played about I don't know half a line and he goes okay Gabriel uh, let's start at the beginning and sing that whole first line that's as far as they got that lesson he had he sort of got through the first line singing so the next time it was almost the same he got a little further and then he finally figured out that if he couldn't sing the whole etude, there was no way that he was going to be able to ever play the whole thing. So he kind of got serious about that. And as a result, I mean, I had to, when I play with him, I have to really practice because he always sounds really good because he can hear what he's trying to play. Do your sight singing. When you see the book, you know, when you look at a book, <laughs> Shh, 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 shh,
you know, I'm just looking at what I see here. Yeah, I'm just looking at the book. Well, these are hard, you know, because they're all odd intervals. Uh, there's no such thing as sight reading. Sight reading is a misnomer. It's sight remembering. If you haven't seen it printed before, there's a pretty good chance you're going to screw it up. If you, you know, so it, when you when you look at things, when you look at the Arben book, page one forty-two, or something like that. Okay, all the diminished chords, all the scales, all the there's not enough scales in the Arben book. I mean, Arben book has like it's a shorthand, and then they say you should do this in all keys. Really, has anybody ever read the beginning of the Arben book? All of the words, yeah. Where does it tell you to do the Hummel like this? It's right in the beginning of the Arben book. It tells everybody that. Avoid the forked fingering. I've never done that in my life. What for? Right? How do you feel when you get to that point? Like you're tired? The last thing you want to do is you know, it's it's mentally demeaning. Uh, so you know, think about read everything you see in these books. A bunch of new Arben books came out. How many people have them? All the ones from Q Press. Yeah, there's one on the Arben five valve trumpet. It's twelve. The one that says twelve, twelve etudes, I think it's called. And there's a picture of his five valve trumpet in there, and how, and then all the fingerings that go with this. It's mind-boggling. I don't have a five valve trumpet, so I don't feel obligated to get excited. Now, if you go get Hickman's five valve trumpet over there, you know, you might have use for it. But, but I'm going to figure out ways to use it. Use some of the ideas in that. How many people have an Aaron Harris book? Mm -hmm. How many people have a Frank Can method book? Good, that's a couple. Uh, you know how many A2 books there are? I can't count them. Try to trade books with people. Buy books, trade them. I have 15,000 entries in my library. And of course, I'm a fanatic, so you know, don't do that. But study what is there. We don't need any more books. We need more studying. Let's see what time it is. Let's, uh, let me ask, have a few questions. Any questions about anything? Anything that has to do with trumpet? I only get nervous when people don't ask questions. I start to get nervous now. You have a question? You have a question. I could tell. You could see it. What is it? Um, you said like you don't count patients for students who never practice. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what your goal is. You know, um, I mean, let's face it, you know, if you're trying to make a living uh, teaching trumpet, um, uh, you have to start somewhere. And most of the time, they either start in a, a, a local music store or in, in schools that have private teachers come in and teach some of the lessons, okay? So, you, you, first of all, you learn to teach. When I started teaching at this very institution uh, as a uh, 23 year old know nothing uh, I definitely knew nothing and so I learned a lot in my first year first of all I learned I knew nothing that was the very first thing I learned secondly I learned that um, I needed to teach every student as if they were going to be excellent because that was my job first of all and second of all I didn't know who was going to get excited and excel so that, that was my job, and I'm glad I always did that because uh, the greatest part of looking back on what I've been doing in the you know, last 50 plus years is watching what my students are doing. It's exciting. I, I can remember the names of students I taught when I was a freshman at Eastman. They had a school program. Uh, for they, they paid 50 cents a lesson up in Rochester, and we went in the public schools and we taught 
uh, mostly uh, underprivileged kids how to play trumpet. I'll tell you what, I had some awful good trumpet players. And, uh, you know, we made about $10 a week doing that for four hours. On the, you got paid two fifty or, I don't know, $3 or something an hour. But, I, you know, I got a lot of ex experience doing that. So learn a lot about, uh, and, and first of all, you have to love it. If you don't like teaching, uh, you know, some people teach 40, 50, 60 students a week, which I don't think I'd be able to do that. I, my mind would just crisp out. I, I couldn't do it. But, you know, if you have skills and you're teaching them skills, it, it depends on what you're doing for your lessons. You know, if you're a college teacher, if you're teaching college, the students need to be engaged. If they're not, they need to not take lessons and find ones. I never, I never looked for the best uh, players when I recruited students. I looked for the best students. And people would always say to me, where, where did she come from? I said, oh, she was in the, uh, you know, the uh, Fisk County schools. Oh, that's like a terrible band. I said, yeah, nobody ever paid attention to them. But this person was on the 50-yard line when I went to those preliminaries. And I thought they had potential. So I, I hoped they would come to the University of Kentucky. You see what I mean? You have to, you have to look for the potential is in a learning potential. People who just want to come lessons, get, take lessons and expect to be better because they're taking lessons, it's, I mean, you could have the five greatest teachers in America teaching you, you're not going to get better. It's not an osmotic process, you know, so you, you basically have to choose students wisely. I love teaching at Interlochen this summer. Uh, almost all the students there are highly engaged and ready to learn, you know. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, well, I think, I think first of all, uh, I audition people. I don't audition students. So I, 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 uh, I never really cared about what they played like, honestly. Uh, some of them were really excellent when they came, you know. I never turned down those excellent students. Uh, but, but at the same time, I, I auditioned people who were in, wanted to be uh, engaged in learning. I love to teach. They love to learn perfect match. Some of them learned more. Some of them learned less. But they all, we had the same relationship. And I never taught freshmen at, at a certain point because I didn't want to ever choose one student over another. Because I mean, it got to the point where there were 30 trumpet majors just like there are now here. There's, there were 30, 25 to 30 always. And I can't teach 25 or 30. So I put the, the eight or 10 freshmen in a class and they were met at 7.30 a.m. on Wednesdays. And on 7.30 a.m. we warm up for 15 minutes. We do some kind of different warm up every time. And then I would say, okay, Bill, why don't you get up and play the characteristic study? Of course, they didn't know what I was going to ask them to play out of the, everybody played the same materials, which some people think is weird. I don't. Do you do that? Do you go to, when you go to English class, do you tell your English teacher that you're a poor reader? So they should give you an easy book to read? I don't think so. You, you up your game in reading. And the same thing with trumpet. You don't have to be able to play the highest or the fastest or the loudest or any. You just have to be able to play the materials. So I would ask them to play. And then there were some students that were never prepared. There were some students that would show up half the time. And there were other students that didn't pay attention at all. So at the end of the year, I put up a little, little thing and it would be the list of the students I was going to teach next year. And invariably, there'd somebody come up and get all huffed out, you know. And I'd, I'd say, well, look, you know, you're not on the list because you don't need a teacher. You, you, you need to pass the class. And so you're going to study with a TA. Because all you need to do is complete the requirements that are in this book. And that's all you really want to do. And, you know, so that's okay. I'm fine with that. I don't want to teach you because you'd have a bad experience. And I don't want you to have a bad experience. And then, but now, Harold over there, Harold has a real bad embouchure problem. And I'm, I know I want to teach Harold. Because he really was, he was at every class. 
He was always engaged. I think he likes the trumpet. I want to teach Harold. So Harold is going to study with me next year. But you're not. Because you don't need a teacher. You need to pass the class. And I want to make sure that you're happy. That make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and you have to pass the class. It's a class. Now, it's more than a class if you're really engaged. It's, it's a wonderful life. Do you know what a wonderful life I have had? I have. I, I'm, I'm a lucky person. I've worked with some of the greatest young people and older people that you can imagine. That's what you want to be part of. So when it comes down to it, you know, we, we have good students. I mean, you know, uh, you've seen uh, Caleb Hudson was around here somewhere. I don't know if he's here. But are you here, Caleb? Oh, good. We can talk about him. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Caleb, when he was uh, 13, he was at everything. And I'd never heard him play because he studied with one of my students. Okay? And when my students would come, my student, Rich Bird, you'll hear him tonight. He's one of the lead trumpet players in my big band. He says, Vince, uh, I got this student. Uh, I don't know what to do with him. I said, what do you mean? He says, he comes in every week. He's got like everything learned and he has questions and he's got all this stuff that, you know. I said, yeah, obviously you're doing the right thing. You need to study with me. And then I went to England and there was this 14 and under competition that was a new at the time. And this kid from Lexington was on the list. And I said, this has got to be the, the kid he's talking about. I didn't know Caleb at the time. I just knew about him through his work. And he came in there and he just, he played the piece down without missing a note. Played the Grand Russian Fantasia, he was 13, and played a high E flat at the end. And I, okay, awful good. Yeah, and when he got, when I made him solo with the band, and actually he just showed me a video of him playing that concert with me and I just about cried. And, and uh, so I had him solo with the, with the advocate band. And I told Rich, Rich says, well look, this, this guy needs to study with you. I said, no he doesn't. I said, you're going to have one student like this in your whole life. I want you to enjoy it a lot. So he did. And, and I mean, I, I can't tell you uh, how uh, wonderful it is to see what he's doing. You know, and how great uh, my student Rich feels having taught him. He just had dinner over at his house. See what I mean? So it's more than taking lessons. It's a good question. You know, but, but it's uh, the relationships that you want to have with your students are ones that they're going to cherish for their whole life. You know, and, and you know, the ones that work, they will. They, you know, I remember when you made me do this. I'm so glad now I can read a score. And I couldn't do any, I couldn't even transpose when I was in school, you know, until you made me do it. And I hated it. And, you know, it was like great. But, you know, if you go at it full throttle, to do the best job, you'll always be happy. And you'll know that somebody's success was not because you didn't give them your full attention. They're, if their lack of success, you know, you don't have to feel that it's your fault. You feel like you've done the best job you can. And maybe, maybe I haven't done the best job, but I've tried to, you know. Any other questions? I know you got to go and eat and stuff, and even I have to eat. Because you know what, my only important saying that I ever made in my whole life that people should remember is that music is something you do in between meals. <laughs> and it puts the perspective on it that you should have every day because once you're finished practicing, sit down, relax, eat, and enjoy your friends and family. Because you'll see that becomes more and more important every day. You know, and you know, uh, most of you have seen, sometimes I, I play a blue mouthpiece. Why do I play the blue mouthpiece? I have it right in my case. I'll probably play it tonight on one piece. For Ryan Anthony, Cancer Blows. And you, if you think, don't forget about Ryan. Because we are lucky. Most of us are very lucky. Make everybody's day really great. When I think I'm sucking, I put the blue mouthpiece in. When I think that I've, I'm, you know, I'm doing something really great, I put the blue mouthpiece in too. I remind myself that how lucky I am. Help people, they will help you back.
And thank you so much for coming to my little class.